Dragon, everyone. Hello and welcome to the final episode of Rogue Refinery, the show where innovation and creativity reign supreme as we build around some of the coolest cards in Magic the Gathering. I'm Ailey Loney, joined as always by Paul Chiana and the wonderful bunch from the Faithless Brewing podcast. Paul, today's card is Riel the Everwise. What are your thoughts on this card if you were posed with this challenge that we've given the three guys? You know, I think a lot of it depends on, of course, the format in question. But I think one of the things that you have to look at is just, of course, finding ways to abuse the second line of text that you see on Riel, which is whenever you discard one or more cards for the first time each turn, draw that many cards. And there are a few ways to do that in standard. And there's a ton of more ways to do that in Pioneer <laughs> and also in Modern. And, you know, the one cool thing about this card is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a removal check. But at the same time, it's cheap enough where there are sometimes situations, especially in standard where it's slower, where you can actually play the real and then follow it up with something where you'll actually get the benefit of that effect right away. And if you can do that, I mean, you're still getting a ton of advantage from this card. All right, well, let's kick things off with standard as always. Dan Schreeder. G'day, sir. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you, Ailey? I'm doing very well. I'm very keen to see what you came up with because I know you had quite a few... Um, ideas running around in your head there. So what did you eventually settle on and what was your record? Yeah, well, like Paul said, there's actually not that many ways to discard things in standard. So the first place that I started was with, is it Phoenix? Straight blue, red Phoenix with some reals and the deck turned out great. I think I played 11 matches. I won 10 of them. I went 5-0 and 5-1 in two best of three standard events. What? Wow. <laughs> That's impressive. Wow. That is, is, is that, is that the best showing so far that we've had? I mean, nine and one overall. That's, that's really impressive. <laughs> That's the best so far. I mean, I don't know. We still have to get through this episode. <laughs> <laughs> True. Nicely done. All right. So tell us about the shell. Why Why is it Phoenix? Why do you think this is the best place for you? Yeah. So it's about abusing that trigger. So you'll get a bonus every time you discard cards. And it turns out that Arclight Phoenix, which is a deck that we haven't seen for a minute, uh, already <laughs> wants to play cards like that. So think of Thrill of Possibility. Think of Radical Idea. Cathartic Reunion, you want to get the Arclight Phoenix into the graveyard so that uh, you can profit when you cast three spells and bring it back. Um, it also tends to be a spell-heavy deck. So Riel's other ability, which is that her power will grow as you get more spells into the graveyard, uh, the Arclight Phoenix shell sort of already supports that naturally. There's a couple of cards in here that are, I'm going to go with unusual or cards that we haven't really seen too often in the blue-red decks. And the cards that I want to ask about are both Merfolk Secret Keeper and Ox of Agonis. What was your what were you thinking about when we were choosing to put those cards in your deck? Yeah, so let me start with the Ox of Agonis, because this is one of my favorite cards. <laughs> and this is a card that wasn't really available in standard the last time Arclight Phoenix was really a contender. The function of the Ox is to provide a backup plan. Um, Arclight Phoenix is a recursive engine, so the longer the game goes, uh, the more likely you are to uh, be able to bring the birds out of the graveyard and, and keep attacking. But you will eventually run out of resources. So Ox of Agonis means that actually that won't happen. Uh, the longer the game goes, the more likely you are to find an Ox. Uh, you can escape that any number of times. So just having Ox means that my sort of end game plan uh, has a has a nice safety net. And it makes sense that the, that you'd want to play Merfolk Secret Keeper in the deck using the Venture Deeper Adventure on yourself instead of on your opponent. So you're just filling your graveyard up, get the Ox in there, perhaps. You know, I don't know if you'd ever rarely play it from hand most of the time, but yeah, you can just get in the graveyard, keep refilling it, refueling it, and es escaping it as much as you can. So that makes sense. Yeah, the Secret Keeper was one that I initially had not included because, uh, you know, I thought maybe I just want more spots for draw discard effects. But it turns out that it's so important for all these different roles. So it's a one mana spell. So you now have Opt, Shock, mm -hmm. and Venture Deeper when you're trying to get three spells in one turn. Um, it mills you. That not only finds Arclight Phoenixes, it provides fuel for the Ox of Agonis. It even increases Riel's power. And then just having an 0-4 blocker uh, is actually just quite nice. Um, you know, we're seeing a sort of mini resurgence in Jund food and sacrifice strategies. There's, it turns out there's a ton of decks where it's just kind of nice to have a cheap 04 that you can run interference with until you get your <laughs> uh, flying in game online. Another interesting card that I see in this list is a card that I think you've had success with previously as well. And uh, a card that really doesn't see a ton of play, but it seems like every time you put this card in your deck, you seem to do pretty well. And that's Sprite Dragon. How has Sprite <laughs> Dragon been in this deck? <laughs> I'm always trying to find a home for Sprite Dragon. So <laughs> in this deck, it's more of a role player. It actually just sort of gives you something to do. Uh, you need the ability to take Teferi off the battlefield, to take Narsa mm -hmm. off the battlefield. And sometimes uh, 
if it turns out that you can't sort of effectively remove what they're doing, you just have to go bigger. And Sprite Dragon lets you go big and get uh, large flyers. But this is actually a card that I cited out a lot of the time. Um, in a blue-red strategy like this, you have the ability to switch into a more controlling role. So if you try this deck out, which I highly recommend, uh, don't be afraid to get creative uh, matchup to matchup and figure out, you know, do I, do I need more creatures here? Do I need more removal spells? Uh, there, you know, you have the ability to play a game that uh, can just play for the long game and eventually win with a recursive engine just with Phoenixes and Oxes. A couple months ago when we did see Arclight Phoenix, it didn't have any way to really refill the hand. And that's what, you know, I think Riel is so powerful here because half the time you're just dumping spells, hoping to find something else to get these pigeons, or I call them pigeons, the Arclight Phoenixes <laughs> out of the graveyard and swing in. But, you know, with Riel down on the battlefield, it's just like, okay, cool, I'm going to grab a whole bunch more cards and then we can do this again the next turn and the next turn and the next turn. And I might just kill you with, I don't know, an 11-3 Riel because she's enormous now. So, oh, she cool. really is. Yeah, she gets huge. Um, <laughs> and that can happen early as well. So one thing that I found was that it's often not the case that you can just hold Riel forever. Uh, you sometimes just have to play her on turn three and hope you untap. Um, if you do get to untap, you could do something like Cathartic Reunion the next turn, draw two, sorry, discard two, draw five. Uh, that sounds like a better <laughs> deal. <laughs> yeah. Then maybe you discard That's a sweet. Phoenix, cast two more spells, and you're attacking for eight. You know, Riel has five power all of a sudden. The Phoenix came back and your spell was a shock to clear away the blocker. So really, at any point in the game, you have the potential for an explosive turn. Uh, even just having a couple of good turns with Riel can give you all of the fuel you need so that uh, if they do find their removal, that's OK. You know, you have a, a good engine uh, coming back to the graveyard. And you've got so many resources. So, I mean, you had a really incredible record. Um, and I think at this point, kind of the, the big the deck to beat, I think, is largely considered to be a, a team of reclamation. How do you mm. think this deck uh, goes go, matches up against that deck specifically? Well, it's tough. I mean, they're often main decking Mystical Disputes and Aether Gusts, and you get hit by both of those. Uh, on the other hand, you've got Mystical Disputes and you've got Aether Gusts, so it's really kind of just an all-out uh, battle, uh, just trying to impose your will on one another, and you have to be cagey. <laughs> um, you want to try to catch them on a turn, they tap out for Wilderness Reclamation, but it's not easy. So I don't have enough of a sample size to say for sure how that plays out. I mean, that, that deck was just absolutely dominant on, on the Pro Tour weekend. So I'm not saying this is the way to take out that strategy, but I was successful in the one match I played against it. All right, Dan, before we let you go, I have to know, how many cards did you draw in a single go? <laughs> well, so you look at the card Riel, it only gives you a rebate on the first time you discard in a turn. So Cathartic Reunion lets you discard two, draw three, and Riel will give you two more cards. So you might think that drawing five is the most you can do. But it mm -hmm. turns out that Ox of Agonis lets you discard your entire hand. So I had a few games where, you know, when I got to just do my thing and go off, um, you know, I cast Cathartic Union two or three turns in a row. And then on the last turn, I play Ox of Agonis from the graveyard, discard four cards out of my hand, draw three from the Ox, draw four more from Riel. So I drew like seven cards off, oh off the Ox. Wow. Uh, so the deck is just an absolute joy to play. Um, and it's just nice to see the birds or the pigeons taking flight again. Uh, I miss them. It's nice to sort of... Yeah. You know, Revisit old friends. Yeah. Oh, I'm glad that you got you had such success with the Arclight Phoenix because I really do miss those those little pigeons. So GG's Dan. <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing this list. And I hope that our audience will enjoy playing it because it certainly sounds like an absolute blast. All well, ten and one with this deck. I mean, could this be the resurgence of Arclight Phoenix? Narset's not so popular anymore, so maybe we get to do all these fun things, right? Yeah, I Hopefully. mean, it, it, it's it's really interesting. Yeah, you, you, like you mentioned, people are playing less Narset. There's a lot more people playing the Reclamation deck, uh, which doesn't play Narset main typically. And you know, one of the things is every every time you know meta shift, people always go, "Oh, the Arclight Phoenix deck," because that has just a really <laughs> powerful core available to it. And you know this this is one way to make it work. And the thing that I really like about this specific build is the combination of both Riel and the Ox of Agonis means that you can play the long game. You know, oftentimes with the with the Arc Life Phoenix decks, you've had issues before where it's like, ah oh, man, I need to cast an opt and hope to hit another opt mm -hmm. and hope to hit a bunch of spells in a row. But now you have the backup plan, right? You have a huge graveyard. You can you can cast those Ox of Agonises out of the graveyard. And additionally, if you ever get to cast anything off the Riel, I mean. You know, you're just going to have so many cards. I wouldn't be surprised if Dan had to discard the hand size in some of these games. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see that at all. And even if you don't find Riel, you know, you have a backup in the Sprite Dragons. You hopefully have your Arclight Phoenixes in the graveyard doing their thing. Otherwise, you know, you could just beat them to death with the Ox if push comes to shove. Yeah, exactly. Just a lot of different angles of attack here with, of course, just that very powerful blue-red spell shell. 
Kevin Swift there along to Pioneer, and that, of course, means getting David in here. David, how you doing? Good, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. Looking forward to seeing what looks like a standard deck at first glance in action. So tell us about your approach with Riel and how did the deck do? Yeah, so my first impression was kind of like, Dan, I want to get, you know, these discard spells and I found those to be pretty weak. So the effect of cycling uh, has discard built in. So all these cards that have the ability of cycling are cards that trigger Riel. Now they only get one card a time, only get one card each time, <laughs> but you get to do it very cheaply uh, on turn four, you can play Riel and, and cycle. And then every turn after that on your turn or their turn, you can get an extra card. And those cards start to add up uh, very quickly. When I first uh, played this deck, I was like, wait a minute, this is just a standard cycling deck. You know, we see Flourishing Fox, Valiant Rescuer, we got Teferi in there too. But then you start to see all the cards that, uh, you know, you'll you'll find Pioneer, like the Sensors, and then a few interesting little uh, one-offs down here in the artifacts. Corrupted Grafstone and Abandoned Sarcophagus. Yeah, so I think people are familiar a little bit with sort of the Pioneer cycling deck that existed before the uh, rule change to Companions. That was playing Zerda and was trying to kind of win by Zenith flaring out their opponent. Uh, I, I never liked those shells, even when uh, companions were more powerful. And, and now that Zerda is really a thing, um, I really want to move away from that. So Abandoned Sarcophagus is sort of like your Luris, if you will. It lets you rebuy Flourishing Fox and Valiant Rescuer. But it also makes all the counter spells in your graveyard live. So you get to recast your uh, Neutralize after you cycled. You get to recast your Sensor after you cycled it. Um, you get to cycle cast out and then cast it as an instant still from your graveyard if you have this in play. So it's just five mana draw a card, destroy any permanent. Um, it just gives <laughs> you this inevitability. It functionally increases your hand size by, you know, I don't know, seven or eight. Uh, and then it also lets you rebuy threats. So you don't actually run unless they have some way to attack a graveyard, which they never do in game one. They don't have a way to run you out of threats. You just replay Flourishing Fox or, or Valiant Rescuer over and over again. Yeah, and it makes sense. I mean, given that you're no longer playing the Zenith Flare, you don't really care about having a fully loaded graveyard so you can play this a little bit sooner. And uh, I mean, it looks to me that this is kind of like something that you want to play what, more on like turn six or seven, right? You know, get this and play with maybe a maybe a, a neutralizer or something in your graveyard. Yeah, exactly. And it's one of in the deck. So people would sometimes like bring in graveyard. Hey, you don't need the graveyard to win though. So are you gonna, are they going right. to bring in multiple rest in peace to target your one abandoned sarcophagus? Um, <laughs> you know, it's sort of like your fourth Riel. You know, she is legendary. Uh, the second one doesn't do anything. And so this is like your fourth card that pays you off for having all these cycling cards. And it's, it, it happens to be a card type that cannot be interacted with by Blue Black Inverter, which is the best deck in the format, in my opinion. So, you know, the format, I think, I feel like has been shaken up a little bit um, with, you know, the changes to, of course, the companion rules. How do you think this deck now matches up to, I guess, maybe the updated meta? Has the meta shifted at all? I think the meta right now is very uh, combo focused, especially after uh, Theros and Ikoria. And the decks are, you know, Lotus Breach, Blue Black Inverter, you know, whether it's the Urian or the 60 card version, um, the Mono White Heliod Walking Ballista. And if you want to call <laughs> um, Jeskai, Urian, Luka, is that a combo deck or, is, you know, it's a frustrating deck to play against, whatever you want to call it. All these <laughs> decks are either a combo deck or a deck that's trying to go big enough to beat a combo deck. And so this deck, I think, is actually super well positioned. You can be the tempo deck if you want. You can play a, a turn one flourishing fox and just beat them down while they're trying to assemble their lower speech combo. Or you can play a super long game because cards like Abandoned Sarcophagus and Riel give you this like huge uh, late game advantage. As the, as the turns go along, every every turn cycle Riel survives, you're drawing two extra cards and you're just drawing towards your, you know, whatever, Boon of the Wish Giffer or whatever. So how did this deck end up doing a roll? I went 5-0. Hawaii 5 oh, man. Guys. Yeah. Re up, up, you sweet. know what's really funny? It's going into this. Everybody's like, ooh, Riel, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. And now we have Turns a 10-1 and a 5-0. <laughs> Ailey said she demanded nice. a 5-0. So Dan and I, you know, we had to we had to get tough. We had to do what she asked, you know, as a going away present. So nicely no. done. That is, that is super duper good. The deck plays out really sweet. You know, it's almost like a Delver deck for people who played Delver back in standard. You can resolve an early flourishing fox and just protect it. You protect it with sensor. You protect it with neutralize. You get rid of their blockers with a cast out. And then you have this like flash threat in Shark Typhoon. And then against decks that are playing like Fatal Push or maybe Flourishing Fox isn't that good because the removal is so efficient, you just become like a full control deck that's just trying to stick like an abandoned sarcophagus or a real and get a couple extra cards. And then all of a sudden you're way ahead. So it, it, it takes both roles very easily, 
And because the format is so combo heavy, the fact that you're main decking uh, eight counter spells and you can play even more after board, uh, you're just well, really well positioned against those. This deck sounds very annoying to play against. And of course, our favorite three mana planeswalkers in there, Teferi Time Raveler. So I bet he got in a few people's nerves. But yeah, nicely done, David. Thank you. Yeah. So I have a question with Riel, you know, in terms of how um you were able to how you sequenced playing the real right because you know in 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 standard maybe it's the the discard options are a little clunky so you have to wait till turn mm -hmm. five maybe with this i mean you you can get value right away because you have so many one mana cyclers were you often waiting on the real and not just slamming it on turn three yeah i was never playing real on turn three and i was never playing valiant rescuer on turn two real i always wanted to get a card out of her if i if i could and it's, it was tough for me to kind of balance the number of lands to play because so many of your cards, you know, they collapse into a text box of a bad opt. Um, <laughs> and we still have played the four, cyc four cycling lands, although two of them are the, the Jeskai Triome. But yeah, I always wanted to get a card out of uh, Riel if I could. And you mentioned the term um, removal check, uh, Paul. That's a term some of us uh, old school players like to use. Against some of these combo decks in, in the second game, like what are they going to do? They have to leave in some removal because you can't just get them with Furnishing Fox or Riel. They, they just take over the game if they don't have it. But then if they have a bunch of removal, like there are multiple times I saw that they like revealed like a bunch of Fatal Pushes with their Narset, I just cycle away my Flourishing Fox. It becomes something else that Fatal Push doesn't interact with. Riel being three <laughs> mana is very important in Pioneer specifically. There is no Lightning Bolt to kill her and Fatal Push is not always turned on. So it's, they're always spending two mana, often at sorcery speed, to try to kill her, and you have so much uh, things that can protect her. You're always getting at least a card, and often more than that. So um, she just sits in a great spot. I rarely boarded her out, only against uh, Lotus Breach would I reduce the number, because it is such a powerful card. And then she's just a clock by herself. Forget about the card advantage, she's a 7-3. Seven seven so Lotus Breach, <laughs> I mean, what are they going to do? They, they have... Uh, Damon's favorite uh, O3, that, that stops one attack. Okay. The Ooh, matcher. the grazer. Yeah. <laughs> the grazer. The grazer, the grazer you know, grazer jumps in front of the bus one time. And then, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, after we sing some songs about the, his efforts, I mean, the next turn she's, deal she's dealing 10. I mean, it, it, she's just a clock by herself and she's drawing you to the cards that matter. So against them, you don't need a flourishing fox. That finds counterspell. Against other people, counterspell is bad. You're cycling uh, sensor, you're finding flourishing fox. So you, you get to switch roles and, uh, yeah, it's just a super cool deck, and you can take a bunch of different lines depending on the circumstances. And there aren't really a lot of aggro decks in the format right now to punish the fact that um, a lot of your cards are a little overcosted because they are cycling cards functionally. So it sounds like the deck is pretty adaptable. It can just switch and change as needs be, and then you know, like you said, going to sideboard is like, okay, cool, I'm I'm the aggressor now, or nope, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be the nope. Uh, so yeah, it's it's super cool to see that this did so well in a format that's pretty much solved at the moment. So. I'm keen to see if we'll see a few more of these uh, running around on, <laughs> in uh, in Pioneer. Yeah, a lot of room to try it out. Uh, Riel was the only red card I played in my 75. Mm -hmm. So uh, you could play extra red cards in the sideboard. I kind of wanted to make sure they were all very easy to cast. Uh, it felt like a free splash because, again, the, the decks were not aggressive. I could freely shock myself as much as I wanted to. And as long as that's the case, I think she's she's worth splashing for by herself. She, she was really powerful. But if you think of like a three-mana card that is like a five three that draws four cards. Uh, you know, Paul would say we need. Yeah, to, that seems pretty good. Paul would, Paul would say we need to tweak some knobs on that kind of a card. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we might need to knob that one down. Maybe go down to the second toughness so it can be shocked. Yeah, yeah. It's like oh, a no. it's like yeah. a mole drifter that wins the game if they don't. Oh kill my god! Away. See, now you're speaking my language. Maybe exactly. I got I got to speak to you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oof. You, <laughs> you get me. You get me. <laughs> awesome stuff, David. Thank you very much for sharing this super sweet cycling list with us. So, Paul, super successful outing here for Riel. I mean, is this card just like a diamond in the rough of people have been sleeping on it for, I don't know, however long it's been out? Well, I, I mean, I, I'm not 100% sure if it's just the Riel, but I think just this deck was really cleverly constructed because it, you know, as David uh, alluded to, th this deck can play in many different roles. And the thing that makes it so powerful is the fact that he mentioned, if you know your opponent has removal spells, you can just cycle. You can just cycle. Mm -hmm. And because of the nature of the format, because it's on the slower end, well, guess what? Your late game is going to mean that you're going to have so many more cards than your opponent. You're playing a deck with four copies of Boon of the Wish Giver along with that Riel, <laughs> which just gives you kind of that turbocharged way to draw a bunch of cards, let alone that even that one copy of Abandoned Sarcophagus 
is yeah. a really sweet addition to the deck because guess what? If the games do go along, well, all of a sudden you're going to have a couple of counter spells in your graveyard to choose from as well. So really, really awesome deck. I really want to give this deck a try just because, um, you know, to all the points that he mentioned, you know, if there's not a lot of aggressive decks in the format, this might be, you know, a, a really, really strong choice in the current Pioneer of metagame. Last but not least, we have to catch up with Damon and find out how he did in Modern Fingers Crossed for three out of three awesome decks. Damon, how'd it go? Well, I, I thought my deck was pretty sweet, um, but I was definitely the yin to my colleague's yang, or vice versa, <laughs> oh, I'm not no, sure which. that's no good. <laughs> um, hmm. I went two, three, twice uh, with a couple different uh, Riel-based decks, and I just didn't feel like Riel was super on the modern power level. All right, so what, uh, what did you try out then with Riel? I brainstormed a few different ideas and ultimately decided to kind of just build a list based off Hollow One, just because that mm. deck plays these cards that Riel really shines with in the form of Burning Inquiry and Goblin Lore, <laughs> both of which involve discarding three cards at random. And so with Riel, that just means you draw three cards. So it really <laughs> turns that into a major strength. Um, and so this just seemed more appealing than a deck that would maybe be able to discard one to two cards uh, off the Riel trigger. And Hollow One was a deck that, you know... It, at one point, it was a very strong deck ever since Ken Yukihiro top aided a Pro Tour with it. And it's, it's diminished in popularity ever since, especially since <laughs> Faith of Looting got banned. Yeah. Um, but it still has some busted starts. Yeah, I w I w that was the card that I was going to mention because I was thinking, you know, <laughs> with the inclusion of Faith of Looting, oh, uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> Don't tease Hollow me. One was already a pretty good deck, but, uh, you know, it, it has basically been forgotten since. The uh, the rotation or sorry since the banning excuse me of a faithless looting so uh, you know I mean but at the same time I mean this list looks super interesting right you have uh, you know that that sim the same core but you have the ability to kind of fill up with that real why exactly you know did this not really work out the way that you wanted it to. So the feeling I have is that Riel is fundamentally pushing you into this mid-range space. You want to play Riel on turn three and then start getting value from it turn four. You can bring that value into a game advantage in turns five or six. And this is compared to like the classic Hollow One, which is coming at you pretty fast with Blood Gas and Flame Lake Phoenixes and all sorts of stuff really early. And so as a result, we have to build this deck that can grind a little bit more into the mid-game. This is the time where people are playing, you know, Worm Coil Engines or Primeval Titans, all sorts of just big, nasty things that Modern has, <laughs> or establishing Cryptic Command, Mystic Sanctuary loops, or all sorts of things. And so as a result, like, going in this mid-range direction with Riel is hard with the set of cards that we have available. Um, you know, for example, there was one game where I had Riel against Tron, and I actually wound up going through my entire deck because I had a one coil engine. I couldn't actually get lethal um, before Been they drew there. an O-Stone when Been I had one there. card in my library. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I've drawn um, my whole deck, but I cannot beat the end game boss that is the one coil engine. <laughs> yeah. So Damon, this is an is it deck through and through, but I see you've got four copies of Street Wraith in here. Yeah, the dream there was that there are in fact just a good bunch of spells in Modern that kill Riel just on the spot. Uh, mm -hmm. If Riel even makes it to the battlefield without getting you know, Archmage Charmed or whatever. And so Street Wraith <laughs> at least means if you tap out on turn three for Riel, you can immediately get value. Um, and that's actually, you know, it's a two for one. That's that's at least something. Um, and so I was kind of excited to try this just to have this guaranteed thing. And at the very least, you just cycle it. And then yeah, I was paired against Burn and realized, oh, man, this two life is like not a <laughs> trivial cost. Um, yeah, and maybe, maybe you like, want to hang on to that. <laughs> yeah, the first Street Wraith is fine. The times you're cycling the second third fourth ones uh is you just kind of can't really afford to pay that without having like a death shadow base for your deck a card that i want to ask you about is uh, a card that i've almost never seen uh being played in modern which is bizarre trade mage uh, what was kind of your thought process behind this one and how did it really end up playing out in your deck yeah so on the one hand if your deck is just not performing you can discard a bunch of cards to it and have a three four flyer <laughs> punish those sure. poor performers um, i hate this hand <laughs> and three cards is kind of this critical number that lets you play hollow ones for free and so we can set up those sorts of turns if you discard two turns you actually need to have one mana per hollow one which is not always easy to do and Meanwhile, if you have a Riel, actually Bizarre Trade Mage becomes this insane card where you guys talk about Mole Drifters in yeah. David's list, but you know, Bizarre <laughs> Trade Mage draw five, discard three uh, with a three, four flying stats is, is quite strong. You know, the one thing that I noticed from this is you, with Modern, you have access to uh, very, very cheap ways to go through a ton of cards, right? You have the four copies of the Burning, Burning Inquiry and the four copies of the Goblin Lore. 
were you able to go off a few times with that real? You know, I know yeah. you can, you already kind of had that hollow one shell, but were you able to just be like, okay, I did my thing, bunch of hollow ones, drew a bunch of cards, I got this one. <laughs> yeah, frequently I was able to, I mean, I won some matches, right? Like I <laughs> won four matches in total out of 10, you know, let's ignore the denominator for a second and just focus on those four. <laughs> A lot of these wins were from Riel just going way over the top. You play Burning Inquiry, and all of a sudden, you just it's like a red ancestral recall. Mm. Um, and sometimes you play Burning Inquiry turn one, and you see your opponent discard a few Tron lands, and you're like, I wonder if I got them. <laughs> uh, and sometimes you get them. <laughs> sometimes you make their hand better, but usually, you know, it, the variance tends to work in your favor with this sort of deck. The thing is that a lot of times the core Hollow One game plan without these Blood Gas or Flame Like Phoenixes to really grind through really struggled against cards like Bone Crusher Giant. That card is actually just the nemesis of this deck. You play turn one Flame Blade Adept instead of your turn two Burning Inquiry into Hollow Ones and stomp into Bone Crusher. It trades with both halves of that uh, very mm. just effortlessly. <laughs> yeah, and that so... was the trouble I was having as well when I when I tried this list out. I was like, oh, cool, Flame Blade Adept. Yeah, you're going to become enormous. So, you know, I go through this whole motion of discarding a bunch of stuff with a couple of Flame Blades down, and then my opponent just waits until I attack with this massive little critter and just like, oh, you're dead now. It's like, oh, come on, let me have yeah. my fun. Yeah, it's tough. You have to play that card. It's like actually the best one drop in the deck, but it just, just dies. Um, <laughs> and then Real dies. also dies. There's just matches like I played against Blue Moon, and they just <laughs> bolt, stomp, stomp, fire prophecy, bolt, stomp. I was like, all right, we, you win, man. <laughs> Let's go to the next game. So, so question, you know, we, we again, kind of going back to the faithless looting thing. Do you think if you had access to that card um, in this specific build of the deck, you know, you have, obviously have to tweak and tune a little bit. Do you think then? The deck would have what it needs to to actually succeed or do you feel like ultimately riel was just not the type of card that uh you might necessarily want in modern just on a pure power level basis the modern where faithless looting is legal is such a different world um <laughs> i suspect it would make real better because cards like bolt are pretty bad against dredge which would become the new tier zero menace of the whole format is <laughs> my guess and so then you play riel and as long as you don't get you know blown out super early it's okay if real has zero power actually the the deck really can let the other cards win it's nice if real is like a seven three but it's kind of more of a bonus than a necessity maybe i just tell myself that even though if she was seven three more reliably i would have won more games <laughs> <laughs> but your opponent you know your tron opponent's just busy cycling their relic and to find tron and they just accidentally nuke your graveyard <laughs> like all right zero three yeah mm, womp womp <laughs> I always want to briefly mention, I tried a Grixis list. So the hope was that if you bring in some discard spells and collective brutality, which actually the Escalate works quite well with Riel also, uh, would let the deck be able to scale up against some of these bigger modern endgame engines. And it's an interesting theory. The results didn't really bear it out, and it didn't really feel that much better. But certainly something to you know think about if you consider brewing with Riel in the future in modern. All right, good thing to keep in mind then. Well, thank you very much. Damon, for showing us how you did with Riel in Modern. Unfortunately, not having the same success as your peers, but you know what? You got some massive Riels and hollow ones down on the battlefield, and, you know, that's all we can ask for at the end of the day. So, good job. Yeah. So, Paul, final impressions on Riel the Everwise. Well, you know, I think uh, it saw a ton of success in both Standard mm -hmm. and uh, in Pioneer. I think the issue, the main issue with it in Modern was it might have just been in the wrong shell. You know, the part of the strengths of a Hollow One deck is the fact that it can really get going early and then have a bunch of really resilient threats that keeps punishing your opponents over time with Blood Gas and the Flame Wake Phoenix. And that no longer exists. And now it was trying to play this mid range, kind of this mid range game plan, which doesn't really quite work, I think, with the Hollow One strategy. Perhaps mm -hmm. you can maybe try it in a more, you know, Jess guy or, or, or is it mid range deck? And maybe you can have a little more success there. But uh, I really like the way that it was positioned in Pioneer and, uh, you know, in Standard. Blue red spells, always a thing. Return of Arc Light <laughs> Phoenix. Let's go. I want to see this deck. I want to see this deck in action. And uh, you know, who knows? Maybe sub somebody submits it uh, in some uh, upcoming player store events. We'll see. Maybe, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> One can only hope. But friends, just want to say thank you very much for joining us in these six episodes of Rogue Refinery. This is our final episode, as we mentioned in the beginning of the show. So. Dan, David, Damon, just want to say thank you guys very much for bringing your brews, your insights, your creativity to the show. It's been an absolute pleasure watching you work, and it's been almost, it, it's been hilarious, it's been insightful, and it's been absolutely wonderful seeing what you've come up with. So thank you very much for that. 
Yeah, thanks for having <laughs> us. I mean, we do this every week over at the Faith is Brewing podcast, but you know, a new set comes out four times a year. It's a perfect time to just get in there and start getting creative. Before we say goodbye, I have to ask you guys, what was your favorite deck from the Rogue Refinery? Do tell, Dan. Uh, well, before today, I would have said that it was my uh, Vage Rock deck from episode three, because that was a card mm -hmm. that I didn't think was going to work at all, and the deck ended up being a lot of fun. But after trying Riel Phoenix this week, you know, it, it only took one game seeing all four birds come out of the graveyard and go soaring across <laughs> the battlefield. But I think it's love. I, this deck is amazing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it, it seems like the the archetype that's really being slept on that you've had a lot of success with is just that blue-red spells deck. I mean, I just don't see it a whole lot, right? You don't see a whole lot of people playing it, but but then I hear reports from you going, yeah, no, I, I smushed my opponents again, <laughs> you know, and uh, over and over again. So that, that was really cool to see. David, what was your favorite deck? I'd also have to say this week, uh, the Real Cycling deck, uh, one of the maxims about control decks is the amount of time when you're winning is so long. <laughs> so the, the matches, <laughs> the games I lost, you know, you, you throw down in turn four, you didn't hit your land drops. But the games you win, you're, you can't lose the whole game after turn four, you know, and you're just, you get to look at your hand, you get to look at your graveyard, and your opponent is probably just typing, you know, curses in the chat or whatever, which I don't have open, so... <laughs> You know, actually, I think that's why people kind of hate on control decks in general, because when you just look at the overall win rates of the deck, it's it's fine. You know, it's 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 about the same as everything else. But I think, like you mentioned, it's the for the people who lose to those control decks, it's the amount of time that they spent losing the actual game <laughs> that really frustrates people when they play control decks, you know? Yeah. And as a control player, I love <laughs> I love that feeling. I love being like, wow. I won a 40 minute game one. I mean, I lost mm -hmm. the match, but man, I was winning for way longer than you were. <laughs> and as someone who sometimes has a hard time like finishing in time, the fact that this deck can actually kind of just shut the door really quick was really appreciated. You know, it only takes a couple turns of Riel and maybe a Flourishing Fox in play. And all of a sudden you have 10, 12 power. It's not like you have to do like a Teferi loop or some kind of miserable <laughs> contrivance <laughs> to deck them or something. And Damon, what was your favorite deck? I will not say Riel, <laughs> like my <laughs> colleagues. Uh, I would go back to the Naya Winota classification oh. deck. I've cast a lot of glory bringers, kind of these you know gruel monsters in my day in modern, but nothing really feels like a gruel monster like a twenty three twenty three. <laughs> Even though it's not cruel at all, it's so uh, white green. Mm -hmm. You know what? I what was going to say that too. I'm like that 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 classification list. That was just mm, chef's kiss. Yeah, no, that was that was really that was a really really innovative list. That was one of the coolest decks that I saw. Where you know you trigger that Winota, find that Or Touch Mage, slap that Colossification on, and even just watching that clip uh, that that Ailey shared with me, where she was yeah. able to attack through an ensnaring bridge for the win. <laughs> yeah, uh, for the twenty three points of damage off of a one one. That that was <laughs> that was really impressive to see. Yeah, that was a super super cool deck. Finally, Dan, where can our viewers find you? What is coming up for the Faithless Brewing podcast in future? Yeah, so we're on um, all the major podcast apps and on Twitter at, at FaithlessMTG. We do this every week. Uh, we pick a card and we sort of explore it, sort of plumb the depths, try to figure out what makes a card tick. And we've been following these core set 2021 spoilers uh, really closely. The set looks amazing. Um, I think we've already got you know a growing, growing list of cards. We just can't wait to get our hands on a try. So if you want to just uh, hear us kick around some more ideas and try some <laughs> things out, for, in the name of science, uh, that's where you can find us. We'll be doing this again. That's going to do it from the Rogue Refinery. Thank you once again to the Faithless Brewing Bros. Be sure to go and follow them down below. Paul, it's been a pleasure as always. And to our audience, thank you so much for watching. Uh -huh.